Thank you everyone for coming. Um, tonight is quantum navigation, except that at long last I've covered over a lot of um, um, ground material and so tonight was to be the crossover into actual doing more of the experience, relying more heavily on the experiential aspect. So. We have a lot of new people. Yes, it does. Oh, good. You've watched some of the. Some of you have watched some of the videos. Yes. Okay, so you've got a little bit of a um, understanding on quantum navigation. Okay, quantum navigation. It's been so hard to try to describe what quantum navigation is. It's a long actual practice of empowerment. And there's basically two or three general ways to try to teach it. One is silence. And that doesn't garner very much students. <laughs> and because it takes so long, you basically have to, two, handhold the person through a lot of the practice and a lot of the communications. Because a lot of the communications that's coming from actually your source, I call that the quantum navigator, because your source understands who you are, where you're at, what you're working with, and what's most needed for you to move into your next evolutionary step. And so getting used to the signs that the quantum navigator uses to communicate takes time because a lot of it goes over our head and we relegate a lot of the baby <laughs> throwing it out with the bathwater. So in the practice of silence and hand-holding, one and two, it takes years of it. I've taken two individuals through this practice over the last four or five years. No, it's more like six. Six years. <laughs> no, it's more like seven. <laughs> <laughs> she every moment. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and um, um, the two individuals that have gone through this, they're not lightweights. They've been through a lot of spiritual training and it's a new avenue. And so I like to say that a lot of this is unstructured unstructured spirituality. And a lot of us have come through the school of structured spirituality. And that assists. That helps. There's nothing wrong. We need both, actually, in order to fully empower ourselves with the most important challenge we have, which is facing our own darkness. And so, <clears throat> number three, the third way is what I've done over the past uh, four years um, and I've recorded or videotaped most of those evenings uh, here, um, but I've laid down a lot of groundwork on this material and where it moves into, where your consciousness has moved into. And it's really deep. Um, I would have to say that none of the material on the vid videos is theory. It's experience. And so it's kind of a gem in itself. And now tonight, we've come to a point in the last uh, um, evening session where I went over quite a lot, uh, it kind of reviewed uh, a bit. And I demonstrated through the graphics and all about where this material um, 
where we've gone with this material in seeing that all of uh, the external reality is really inside you. And so all of the answers are inside of you. But, again, they become available when you cross and integrate the darkness, the unconsciousness, the dualities, and bring them back into compassionate appreciation and understanding. So all of what I presented is basically to see out in the cosmos, there you are. <laughs> and in the void, there you are. You're complete out in the cosmos, in the void, and even in Purusha, which is the reintegration of all consciousness. You exist there and in separation. And so the only thing standing in our way is unconsciousness and the judgments that we placed against ourself and reality that we formed when we were less mature, less capable of seeing clearly all these dualities. So, tonight, <laughs> um, I was going to speak to you on these matters um, from the perspective of how do we now put all of what I've shared externally about no matter where you look inside of the cosmos or creation, or even in nothingness. How do you put that together in finding it inside yourself and empowering yourself? And so tonight, that's what I wanted to work with. Um, <laughs> and we're going there. <laughs> First of all, though, I have to say that um, in the practice, there's basically five stages. For those that are unfamiliar with um, deep meditation, there's five levels. And we learn this in our Taoist um, uh, training. So in the Taoist meditational training, one of the first things that they had us do was bring our awareness and attention to our breathing and our deep breathing way down in our stomach. Now I'm going to go over these five steps, but one has to remember that by familiarization, by doing it so often, you're able to take what is presented to you in a challenge and bring it into the quantum, bring your consciousness and what you're going through into the quantum. And that helps you define the difference between mind and consciousness. Consciousness is eternal, mind is limited. All right, so in the first, in the first stage, very simply put, they would have us bring our awareness and attention to deep breathing right down in the belly, or they called it the Donjon or Dantian. And as we breathed there, we began to um, notice that our attention was like a puppy dog, always off on this, that, or the other thing. Our attention was distracted very easily. So, Working with puppy dogs, you cannot demand and command. It does no good. So you invite, and you invite the attention back to the intended goal of bringing the awareness and attention back to the breathing nice and deep. As you do, you begin to become aware that there's a breathing cadence, a rhythm. And that rhythm has a feeling, a sensation. So as you get used to that breathing sensation, pretty soon you start moving in time and it becomes easier to draw the more of the attention away from the puppy or puppies, all the distractions, and into the sensation 
of the integrated energy. So as they had us get familiar with that, then the next step would be, all right, now as you're sitting in your posture, become aware of your emotional and psychological state. So we had to bring both our thoughts and our emotions using that same principle, keeping the focus on the breathing and the sensation of that breathing. And then eventually you could feel all the sensations in the body that you were holding. And these were really important because they represent unfinished, immature processing of past events, past conditions. So, as you felt over the body and became aware of the tensions in the body and the stories that may be running around in your mind that may be associated with those sensations in the body, those tensions in the body, you became aware that you could still bring all of that with you into that integrated energy and then that would help you begin to detach and find the difference between mind and consciousness. Next, they would have you then begin to do postures, hard postures. Well, first, first they had to do moving postures and the moving postures raise the difficulty level and the focus level. So as you started moving and the movements, the different postures, put pressure on different organs, which brought out different issues, brought out different emotions, brought out different psychology, stories that were under processed. And so as you began to be able to move the different postures and keep the attention in the integrated energy, then the stories could exist. The emotions, the feelings that were trapped with those stories could exist and you could find separation between mind and consciousness. And this was really important. And the next stage they had us do was they would put us in a very difficult posture like a horse stance or they called it uh, sleeping tiger. And in that posture, they told us that where the mind goes, energy follows. And when your mind is inside on the breathing, on the integrated energy, well, then you magnify that. But if your mind and attention is on the pain and suffering and stories, well, it magnifies that. So it's your choice. And so consciousness became the quintessential element in helping you to re release, seeing the difference between mind, because mind wants to resolve these things by, it has a million different <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> and they don't work. <laughs> if you research them, you'll find they end in, uh, Disasters, miseries, yes. <laughs> However, if you move to consciousness, then you can detach and let go, and the whole spectrum begins to change for you. So, where the mind goes, energy follows. When the mind is inside, on the integrative energy, then you collect energy. You build chi. You build integrative energy through the entire systems of the mind and body and emotions, and spirit. However, if your mind's on, oh, excuse me, your attention's on the mind, then it dissociates. So you start separating, looking for resolutions in all the wrong places. And so they told us that when you go beyond the mind, oh, excuse me, first of all, you can't change the mind with the mind. You can't change the emotions with the mind. But you can change the mind and the emotions with the body to a very nice degree. 
Now they don't tell you right away, they wait for you to get familiar with the difference between mind and consciousness. Because eventually they say that consciousness can help you change all the above. Mind, body, and emotions. But you got to know the difference between mind and consciousness. And how to reside and abide in consciousness. Alright, so that practice was very, very helpful in defining the difference between mind and consciousness. And so the stillness that comes about when you're in consciousness helps you move to the place where the quantum navigator can now begin to communicate with you. If you remain distracted, then the quantum navigator tries to make an effort to communicate with you, but you remain distracted so you don't employ the messaging that comes from source. So it made that rule. It can't interfere, but it'll assist if you're quiet and still and clear. And that becomes a really important point. Now, let's see if I can Let's see if I can get this thing to work. <clears throat> Here. <clears throat> um, if you think of a Mobius in the emotional and the mental body, <clears throat> when we came into this world as a child, it was very open, clear. No programs. Let's say our first life. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, as we went along and we experienced challenges and we didn't have anyone explain to us such challenges, we typically just labeled them good or bad. As a child, that's all we understood, whether it was good for you or bad for you. And so challenging very challenging emotional conditions. As a child, the emotional body is wide open. The mental body is wide open too. No experience. It's clear, open, ready to receive. The emotional body is the same way. And so, as we go along and we experience challenge, and we polarize the challenge, let's say we polarize it as a bad challenge, all of a sudden, it sets all your circuitry into fight and flight, depending on the level of the challenge. And so it contracts the emotional body. As you repeat similar incidences, it begins a series of contracting the emotional body, while at the same time, in the mental body, it starts expanding the mental body, looking for reasons, stories, answers, experience. And so, also in the mental body, there's one thing that it finds um, leisure in or sanctuary in, and that's that in the mental body there is no pain, not like the emotional body. So, child quickly finds that in the mental body, it's very easy to handle, or much easier to handle situations, and to give them meaning, purpose, so on. So without a, someone to give it clear direction, it interprets as best as it could and writes its own stories. Meanwhile, it begins closing up this emotional body. All right, well, if we were to now those of you who have seen the videos or have been with me for a long time, you've seen how I've relegated Purusha or consciousness as being like this I, nothingness, but consciousness. And so that is like the circle, which is actually more appropriately a sphere. And in the sphere, all dualities are inherently merged. 
So they're integrated. So inside of consciousness, there is no duality. There is, there is no polarity, because they're all integrated. All right, so inside of that consciousness, um, at one point, it in metaphorically came to the conclusion that it'd be a good idea not to know itself, to experience relearning everything <laughs> from scratch. And so in the relearning, in the unconsciousness, since consciousness is everywhere, it had to relegate a portion of itself to go unconscious. Remember, it's one being, one consciousness. So in that consciousness, as it relegated a portion of itself, a portion of its fabric, the best way we can draw this is using a balloon. Take a balloon and split it, twist it at the center in half. Now you have half that's awake and half that's asleep, and that's what this diagram is representing. So, let's say this is the beer, consciousness, and this is the doer. The doer, when experiencing all of the uh, contractions, faces inside of doing, trying to resolve, trying to resolve all of the contractions that it made. Also at the same time, all of the stories that it made according to those contractions. And so what we have here is we have a circle. Half of the circle is stories under process stories and they, over time and repeating them, become beliefs. The other half is the emotions or emotional stories. And so these two work together to hold them electrically and magnetically in place. That's why it's so hard to break these things. So the belief system acts as a boundary of your own consciousness. And until you walk through the boundary and integrate it, accept it, then you remain inside of a cage of your experience of the whole of creation and polarization of yourself and your reality. So, working with the quantum navigator is about going back through these stories and going back through these emotions to break the cycle, the psychological and emotional cycle, which eventually opens these boundaries and makes it possible to take all the polarizations that we have, because we are all of creation, and as all of creation we have all the dualities, and the only place for all those dualities to come back home is right here in the very eye of the needle between these two realities. The eye of the needle between the two realities is, exists right in between the left and right ventricle and the left and right atrium. It's right inside of the heart. It's right inside the center of the twisted balloon. It's right inside of what I've shown on the, um, in the past uh, graphics of the Lanakea and um, Pisces, Perseus Pisces expansion of the created reality and more. <laughs> so working with the quantum navigator is about 
taking these little by little, these stories, so that we can take all of our polarizations. And we've been in, okay, we're gonna make a leap here. <laughs> We've been in every civilization, terrestrial. We've been in every historical period. All our timelines are us, are one. And so that means also terrestrially and extraterrestrially, yes. <laughs> all the different uh, species are waiting for us to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> to our polarization of, on, of them that keeps them at a distance. And as we undo the polarization, then they're allowed to come closer and closer and begin the interaction with us until finally we can bring them all home inside of our own self. So that's kind of it in a nutshell about where we're going. <laughs> now, in the meditation part aspect of this, we usually do like 30 to 40 minutes with this understanding. We've been working on th th this step by step through these four years and working with you two, hand holding through what resistances we normally have to seeing ourselves. And there is a myriad of very amazing um, um, visions and communications that the quantum navigator imparts to you when you're ready. And they include dealing with probably some of the most important aspects are these. Huh. There is seven major roots of unconsciousness in our psyche. Seven inside the temple, so to speak, and nine outside the temple. It resembles the menorah. So, one of the first we experienced when we went unconsciousness and we went into separation was abandonment and betrayal. So the first stories that we created were that of abandonment. We were experiencing the reverence and communion and connection with all things. And then suddenly Somebody had the good idea <laughs> to change that, to take the balloon and twist it so we separate it. Imagine what that feels inside if somebody suddenly took your unconscious aspects and separated from your conscious aspect and left you in the dark. You would feel abandoned. So your first stories would be, what the hell did I do? <laughs> what did I do wrong? <laughs> Pause. Yes, question. Oh, sure. What you just described is my definition of hell. <laughs> that knowing. Yeah. Yes. Everybody else does, but not me. <laughs> well, that's the assumption. Everybody else knows. Because <laughs> we're experiencing it. <laughs> we're experiencing it. Yeah. <laughs> so our first one, abandonment, it feels like, what the hell did I do wrong? <laughs> I've been thrown out. <laughs> and what, what do you... What do you, what's the next story? Well, you, 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 you sit there for a while in that. Remember, you don't have arms and legs yet. You're just an unconsciousness. So without any arms and legs, and without any other beings that you can see, <laughs> you're abiding there going, what happened? <laughs> what I do wrong? <laughs> and imagine the stories that you, one creates when one is separated after having the experience of being fully connected, feeling full reverence in everything you do and communion with all things. So, 
After you hang out in that for a while and those stories, all of a sudden <laughs> you begin to realize, hey, wait a minute, I didn't ask for this. <laughs> so you feel betrayed. And that creates a little bit of rage, <laughs> outrage, indignation. <laughs> Who asked me? <laughs> now we're talking about some archetypal energies. These are huge energies. Where do they come from? Where did you create them? Here. And so, after being in the betrayal, the rage, outrage, and indignation, pretty soon, that's not doing any good, you know, blaming God, <laughs> blaming whatever. <laughs> blame isn't doing anything, so we turn the blame into guiltiness. I must be so bad. I must have done something so wrong. And so here starts the need for penance. The need to repair what's been done. What'd you do? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. You were supposed to. But there's an inherent unknown inside you that wants to quell guiltiness with some kind of penance. I gotta fix what I've done. I gotta fix something. But you find out, oh my God, I'm powerless. I don't have arms yet, <laughs> don't have legs yet, don't have other bodies. So you feel powerless to change your circumstance. These are the issues that defeat us, that we run from unconsciously. We run across the universe and we try to use technology to its hilt so that we can get powerful enough to change the condition, or get religious enough, save enough people, and then maybe <laughs> the door will open. <laughs> Wrong. No matter what we do to change it, you cannot. So it's counterintuitive. And this is what the quantum navigator helps you with. The ability to take these huge archetypal energies and embrace them. Embrace them first, not run from them. And as you embrace powerlessness, you're going to find something that you do have. What do you have if you are powerless? Well, you have three things that can't be taken from you. You are conscious, not mind, conscious. That can't be extinguished. It cannot be taken from you. So powerlessness helps you find that you still have consciousness. And if you still have consciousness, then you still have the ability to communicate. And communicate your boundaries, your needs, your feelings. It's not wrong to feel powerless, and you can't quell it, you can't extinguish it. You can only embrace it, and as you embrace it, it transforms. Because you still are conscious, and you begin to realize, oh, I'm beyond being powerless. I'm conscious. I can communicate. And when I get a body, I'll act. <laughs> I'll get something done. <laughs> Same with worthlessness, neediness, helplessness, hopelessness, and nothingness. To get to nothingness, which is the hardest for the ego. Because everybody wants to be something and validate. We want the validation from the external reality and our friends and family that we are something. But you ain't going to get it if you keep pulling it. Only when you realize it. And that is embracing nothingness. Embracing all of these will take you to the point where you can embrace nothing because what are you? You're conscious. So you transform nothingness 
the ego's version of nothingness because you're relegating yourself to standing full inside of consciousness. And as consciousness you can communicate and you can define your boundaries, communicate your needs. Then that leads you to the two outside one, greediness. What is greediness? Greediness is about wanting things that you think you don't have. Wanting things that you think you don't deserve. Or somehow you have an over-assumption of how much you do deserve because you haven't worked with these things. <laughs> and so you have an indignation and a righteousness <laughs> that's burning you. So greediness and jealousness, not jealousness for, you know, having the perfect boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or husband, but about what you're missing within yourself so that you can be in peace. So these stories then, when I showed the other graphic, all these stories that have these as their bases, they have to be neutralized by acceptance. I accept my powerlessness, but I am conscious, I am aware. So in truth, I'm both powerless and powerful. But that's coming from a Brahmic understanding, not from an ego understanding. To light these and turn this menorah upside down into this is to take your powerlessness, abide with it, and cherish it because you've transformed it. You've used it to discover I am conscious. I'm aware. I can bring my focus to what I want. That's number three. You have the ability to focus your attention and your consciousness. That's commanding your mind. That's standing in mastery of your mind. So. With these stories then, they help you stand here at the, that's right at the twist in the balloon. And that twist in the balloon is the eye of the needle. To get through the eye of the needle, you transform these into who and what you really are. You use these to make yourself vulnerable and naked without story, without emotion that's tied to these incompletely processed portions of yourself. Then you easily move through. And as you do, then you stand the ability, stand in center and the ability to litmus yourself of where you are in the whole of your reality. So now you stand centered, pure, clear, clean, occupying the throne room, all the axes of all dualities. Remember, part of it is conscious, part of it is unconscious. And they're separated like yin and yang, but yin and yang are tied to each other. That's why there's a little dot on either side. That's describing the axes. But to sit in the center, sit in the throne room, is to be able to harness and steward all the fractures of the self through these seven and nine and bring your parts back home, dark and light. And so that's what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go into a meditation and then afterwards we'll work with um, describing portions of whoever wants to share. That won't be on, on camera, but whoever wants to share when they get um, information, vision, or intuitions from their um, quantum navigator to help assist them in this process of bringing all of this back into integration within you. And before we um, uh, change the subject, 
Lisa has taken time to write out a number of really helpful hints. I haven't. You um, haven't even looked at I haven't even. <laughs> but thank you. I for that. <laughs> I've observed your, your process through this whole day. I know how good they are. <laughs> well, I have to review. I have yes. To review. So please review and um, uh, share with it. So you want to um, come up? Here. Should I? Uh, I'm stay. tethered. I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll, can I stand in front of this? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. This is my life, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> if you haven't guessed, I'm one of the two <laughs> that he talked about, who uh, worked with about seven years with this. And w there's a lot of things to remember in doing this practice. Now, because our language is structured and even this lecture is structured to some degree. We operate in structure, so it's a little bit of a paradox because some of what I'm going to talk about sounds like structure when it's meant to be unstructured. But every person that goes through this process is forging your own path. So your path might look very different than mine. However, I think that there's some signposts along the way that are probably universal for everyone. So um, what I did was I wrote down these nine keys and tips from Lisa's personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> and um, hopefully this will help you and then you'll get the handout. Okay, the first one is you'll quickly discover that one of the keys is that you're going to have to learn your metaphorical language. Because the quantum nav navigator only communicates in metaphor. If you are receiving words, that might be great, the guidance might be great, but it's not the navigator. Because the navigator is coming from a realm of your consciousness without body, without a brain, so it has to communicate in universality, in some kind of universal language. And metaphor, for us, it seems to be one of those common grounds. So if you, if you look at the idea of water as an example, um, it has general ideas, fluidity, maybe feminine energy, but you particularly might have another m definition for water within your lexicon, so to speak. So this is, this is one of the most important things at the beginning, is to understand the universality of the symbology, but also what it means to you. And you might not know right away, which is why this practice grows when it's repeatedly done, because then you'll learn when these um, metaphors come to you over and over again. So what I wrote here is that you'll start to see frequent patterns of imagery that reflect what the quantum navigator wants to show you. Often the symbology is the same in your dreams. You're going to see an overlay with your dream state and your meditation state. Uh, that, when I started to see that, it was really, really cool. Um, because that, the, the quantum navigator <coughs> can communicate through the dream state in, in a little bit more easier way because it doesn't have to go through the layers of the mind. So you're going to start to see that uh, correlation. And I, in my experience sometimes, the quantum navigator f would somehow pop a song into my head and it would haunt me until I would Google the lyrics of the song. And then I would be like, oh, <laughs> I feel humble. <laughs> um, and that's the way the quantum navigator is using my subconscious. Because it doesn't have language, but it has access to my subconscious. So it can tap into things in my subconscious, which is why it's unique to you. So that's number one, learning your inner metaphorical language. Number two has to do with, this is comes from classic meditation practice, from any of you who've had those experiences, such as in, in um, Vipassana, as an example, which is um, a very common meditation practice. And it has to do with observation. Watch your thoughts and mental habits and patterns without judgment. So what you end up doing when you're doing this type of meditation is that you are observing what the mind is doing. 
and the only thing that can observe the mind is consciousness. So what, what Ron was talking about, the differences between the two, this idea of observing what the mind is doing is the way to begin to learn what consciousness feels like. So that's why observation is such an important step. Um, watch your thoughts and mental habits and patterns without judgment, such as worrying about something specific or how the mind repeatedly returns to a thought pattern. When you see them in meditation, these thought patterns, you will then be able to see them in your life. Um, because they repeat in your life. It's just when you get quiet in meditation, you, you, you're able to see them. The inner and outer mirror each other. So, a uh, personal example here. <laughs> One of the things I am on, often haunted with in meditation is packing for an upcoming trip. To <laughs> So I'm in meditation and then I start picking, I start thinking, oh, well, I can't forget to pack that. And that's my pattern. And that's what's going through my conscious mind during the day, too. Um, now that's a, kind of a superficial uh, pattern. There are other more deeper patterns that have to do with self-love and self-criticism, self-hatred and all of that. Those are the deeper patterns that you can see later. Um, so when those repeated things come up, it's really important to notice it with the consciousness, but don't engage it with the mind. And also don't push it away. So you're basically just seeing it. Now sometimes, if you're in the middle of like a really personal crisis, those thoughts can be like, um, like a, a vacuum that want to suck you right into the center of it. So how do you deal with that? Again, this is my tip and it's nothing revelatory because the ancients have been using it for millennia, but when I find myself getting sucked into that whirlwind, I go back to the breath. So he talked about that at the very beginning, about how the breath is your anchor, really, to this reality. And when you're lost in that hurricane, go back to the breath. So you, you just notice what, what is uh, disturbing you. Don't push it away, but don't engage in it. Refocus on the breath. Number three, this one, I, man, this was so valuable for me. It took me 50 something years to learn this maybe. <laughs> Feel emotion. <laughs> when emotion comes up, I know, duh, right? When emotion comes up, it's important to feel it and not try to understand it with the mind or not feel it with the mind. So when I was writing this out, they dropped in a, uh, I'm looking at Harry over here. I don't know why you're calling me. When I was typing this up, they dropped in an example to give you. So when we're, let's say, at the beach and we feel the breeze on our face, we can experience have that experience in two ways. One is to mentally say, oh, I feel the breeze on my face, and then think about the breeze and all of that. Or sit there and feel the damn breeze <laughs> <laughs> with no story. It's easy to do that with sensation, uh, body sensation. Emotions are also sensation. It's energy in motion, emotion. It's just sensation of energy. So if we can retrain ourselves when an emotion arises, even the really intense ones like anger or shame or whatever it is, to just sit with it and feel it in the same way that we would feel it, the breeze on our face on the beach. It's the same mechanism. So when Ron was talking here about um, bringing these home, I, I, I used to have a really hard time understanding what exactly he meant by this because his languaging is different, but through my navigation work I learned what he means is feel the damn breeze. <laughs> feel whatever it is that's coming up and just be with it. And that is what happens with the allowance. That is how it 
begins its integration process within you. Okay, number four. Sorry, I'm taking so long. No, no, okay, no, okay. no, no, no. It's important. Um, number four. This actually was uh, given to me by one of the beings I channel, uh, Jermaine. I know most of you know who he is. Um, and I think he had pity on me <laughs> <laughs> to teach me how to get this more intensely for myself. So he showed me, he calls them the spot meditations. He showed me two ways when I'm in the navigation meditation to try to access that energy of consciousness that is not connected with the mind. Number one is to use the physical body. So for instance, if you have a physical pain, like your knee, something with your knee, which we know <laughs> you've been working with for a really long time, and the pain is really bad, much like with yoga, focus on the sensation. So you're sitting in the in navigation session, the meditation session, and you're just with the pain, feeling the damn breeze of the pain, so to speak. What I found that does for me is that as I'm with that <coughs> physical sensation, it's like a quantum doorway opens. And either energy just bleeds out, trapped energy, old stored stuff that I don't even have to know what it is or what it's connected with, or I might see something like, oh, I'm being inflexible, me, right? But again, my mind is not trying to understand the, store, the, the interpretation, it just comes, it just arises. Okay, so that's spot meditation number one. That's when you have an obvious thing to work with, which is a physical pain. But let's say you sit down and there's not something specific to work on. So Jermaine instead would have me do a kind of scanning process. And it's hard to describe because it's not a scanning with the mind. It's just a, <clears throat> a feeling of my energy body and not with my, I'm just using hand for illustration, you don't have to use your hand. <laughs> Maybe I should not. <laughs> Feel your energy body and you're going to be attracted somewhere. Maybe over the heart, maybe in some obscure place like, you know, over one side of your head or whatever it is. You're going to be drawn there, attracted there. And that's going to be where the quantum doorway is that night for you to rest your attention. So you just rest your attention there, even you don't even know why. Rest your attention there, just breathe, relax, and allow the quantum navigator to unfold the experience for you. So that's Jermaine's spot meditation, two different kinds. Number five. Uh, don't be distracted. <laughs> if you receive messages or energetic input from spirit guides or whomever, or you experience some weird, unusual phenomenon, phenomena, don't be distracted by it. Because once we get distracted by it, we go into the story, we go into the mind, and the experience is over. So instead, you can note what the message is, kind of observe it from afar, but continue to stay with the flow of the meditation. I've kind of, for me, developed this process where um, when things happen, this is a metaphor, I don't really do this. I have a way of taking the experience and putting it in a pouch, kind of. And then when the meditation is over, I write immediately in a journal and I open the pouch and I pull out what I pulled in there from the meditation. It's much like writing dreams after you wake up and you know if you wait too long the intensity and the um, profound profundity of it vanishes. The doubt rises. The doubt rises, very much so, yes. That's a really good one. Um, so yes, so don't be distracted by the phenomenon. You can just note what's happening, putting it, put it in the proverbial pouch and then you can go back to it later. Uh, I mentioned this before, this is number six, breath is the default. So if you're having a meditation session that's unfocused or chaotic, 
always return to watching the breath and breathe from the belly. Um, those of you in the channeling class already had a lot of experience with that. Number seven is also something from the channeling class which <coughs> I pounded into your heads and it's <laughs> applicable here too and it has to do with are you in the driver's seat or are you in the back seat? So in quantum navigation you are never ever the driver. You are always in the back seat and you know when we're in the back seat we still have an urge to yell directions at the driver. <laughs> <right>? So <laughs> no. So we have to kind of be aware of our tendency to do that and resist the urge to do it. Um, the, the quantum navigator, people have asked, what's the difference between the quantum navigator and the higher self? Okay. I can only answer this in terms of my understanding or my feeling of it. In our human reality, we have used higher self as a costumed entity that we can relate to that represents our higher self. Okay? I see the quantum navigator as less personified than higher self, more of an energetic force that is all wise, that guides us without words or reasoning or information but just guides us through energy through the obstacle course or the landscape of our own consciousness so it's unpersonified whereas the higher self as I see it is a little bit more personified nothing wrong with that but there's a, a really <coughs> big difference for me okay so um, going back to you're not the driver your job then in meditation is to relax in the back seat as much as possible and let go and let the navigator do the driving. So what happens then if, again I'm speaking from experience, you go into your meditation, your quantum navigating meditation and you, you have an agenda. I want to work on this tonight because it's really bothering me. Well, you quickly get humbled because if you're doing the process correctly in terms of letting go, it's okay to bring that agenda in, but if that's not where the quantum navigator wants to go, you're going to be fighting during the meditation. So you are definitely welcome to bring your requests. But the navigator is the one that really knows where you need to go rather than where you want to go. So that is connected to this idea of being in the back seat. <coughs> okay. okay, so number eight, we have two more now. This next one also humbles me amazingly. Trust in continuity. You are learning your inner map and it takes time. The quantum navigator knows what the map looks like and will always return you to the necessary place on the map of your inner consciousness according to its wisdom. Eventually, it all makes sense. The journey must be trusted. So an example of this is that, um, you know, many of you know I travel to Japan and sometimes we get busy and we don't get to do our navigation sessions as often as we wish. So maybe weeks go by or even a month goes by or more and then we're like okay we really have to do it so we sit down we do it have the experience and then I go to write in my journal and I see the entry from the last one a month ago it, I had picked up exactly where I left off and I had even forgotten what happened in previous ones and that's what I mean by there is a continuity within our unconscious that we are for the most part unaware of unless we try to be more aware of it but the navigator is not unaware of it and there is definitely a continuity that happens which is for me it was really humbling to see that and finally um, number nine is recognize the flow there will be periods where you move really fast and you receive a lot for me in those periods 
I have to say a disclaimer, I've never done psychedelics, okay, <laughs> but my experiences in quantum navigation are, were like, as I would imagine, a psychedelic trip. Mm -hmm. So intense and so, yeah, you can't even describe it. It was like, it, I've had many of those that were like psychedelic trips. So this is what I mean by, that's when you're moving really fast. Things are happening really fast and unfolding really fast. Then the, there will be periods where it seems like you slow down. You might go days, you might go weeks, you might go months. Of course, it depends on how often you do the work, where you're kind of like in, on a, in a plateau, so to speak. And that, as I've found, is a natural part of the cyclical nature of this work. Um, it's the same with what I've talked about with contact work, actually, or even with channeling, that I think that when we go through a, um, an intense period of learning, we need that period of integration and digestion later. So that doesn't mean don't do your work during the digestion process, because you're still doing work, you're just doing a different kind of work during that period. Um, so this process, then, is not really for people in a rush because you'll do be nothing but um, frustrated. You have to allow that the flow, the ebb and the flow of the experience to happen and let whatever arise be okay. In the long view, you will definitely be able to see the contours of your, liner, your inner landscape as revealed to you by the quantum navigator. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. I blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> <laughs> to get that for you, but <laughs> Thank you very much. You should have seen the many hours of trying to explain. <laughs> well, but that's another good example because my way of learning is very different than yours. Right. Right. Should I? Okay, that's another, that's another thing. My way of learning is very different than his. I'm very left-brained. He's not. And even just, well, some of you here know us. You know we're like opposites almost. So I couldn't, un a lot of what I, he was communicating with the twisting balloon and all that stuff, I, I, I understood philosophically, but I couldn't apply it to my navigation until I cleared enough of the crap and then started to have the experiences he talked about that I thought were only philosophical. Hmm. So there you go. <laughs> he, he can say, I told you so. <laughs> One of the rare occasions. <laughs> All right, we're going to do the meditation in just a little bit. Uh, is there any questions that you may have, burning questions about the process? No? I, Go ahead. I had one going back to the higher self and the navigator. Does the navigator <laughs> work through the higher self, or do they work together or separately? Yeah, I'd like to say that the, the navigator is source. And so source will use whatever modality is necessary to get its message across. How yourself so. is the minion of source. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. I see the little headlamp and the goggles <laughs> and the yellow face. <laughs> Golden source. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to say that a lot of that um, what I went through is release and stored negative energy. What you talked about, I can really relate to. My beliefs and what I tell myself and, mm -hmm. and releasing. Yeah. So I totally get what you're saying about all that. It's so deep. These are the roots. I've been for a couple of years now. Yes. About going within and releasing. Yeah. So thank you. I appreciate it. You're very That's welcome. Exactly where I am. Um, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but I had to go within to, to, yes. I couldn't find it anywhere else mm -hmm. I couldn't either okay. and I tried so many different I things 
And do you know the source navigator kept coming in, get in your horse stance. <laughs> we'll show you. <laughs> but ultimately, um, there's uh, shallower layers, and that's the pain, shame, blame, fear, guilt, grief, anger. But to get to these, you have to go through rage, outrage, and indignation, because that gives you the focus to find the answer. And then you start seeing these roots here are what cause our greatest griefs inside. Our greatest wounds are these. But when we own them, all of a sudden, the menorah flips and they light because you transform them. Yeah, you're no longer running. There's one episode I really like uh, that I talk about, and it was a Waterloo moment for me. When I was five years old, my father took my older brother and I, and after a tremendous beating, he stripped us of our clothes and said, if you don't want to obey our ru my rules, you can go out there and try to find um, your own way. At five years old. Now, for me, that was a Waterloo moment, of course, because all of these come up. But as I went back into that and took each one of these one by one, it became the most transformative uh, experience for me. And as I was going through it, suddenly the whole room, because these things are written, they're a, they're a probability line, so they exist. And so I watched the probability line dissolve into that quantum feeling of just unconditional love and completion from all of these issues that arose there. So I found that my dad gave me the greatest gift in the world because I wasn't finding what I needed inside myself. I was looking for it externally and that's the definition of unconsciousness. We search the universe for our completed aspects, our completed needs. And we can't find them until we look inside. Can I share something? Sure. I didn't talk to my mom for 15 years because of things like you spoke about. And in the last nine months, her and I talk, but I had to go within and I had to deal with all that yeah. to move forward. Yeah. And my daughter is 16 and she's never even met my mom. But we, I call her every week, I see how she's doing. So it can work. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we look back at our parents, nobody taught she, them this. But she taught me to be a great mom. <laughs> she did. <laughs> By all, if I had not gone through that, I would not have known the importance yeah. of teaching your children and being a good mom. So I'm really grateful. Uh, I really am. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Are you, for something like this, but I understand. <laughs> Um, are you to go through each of those roots for each issue, or can each issue you just identify which root? The quantum navigator will give you lesser uh, condition, lesser challenges for you to break your teeth over. And as you get familiar with it, then it can start giving you more and deeper until finally it can throw everything at you and you can be just as solid and centered in yourself and self-fulfilled without negative judgment. Can I, can I address that? Yes. Again, from my perspective as having been dragged through this. <laughs> <laughs> Some nights. <laughs> When you're, go I, I, I saw it as a jungle. That was the, my metaphor. It was always a jungle of stuff that I was cutting through with a machete. And I didn't, when I was being navigated through it, I didn't know their labels. 
So don't even worry about the labels. The labels actually only matter after you've gone through the jungle and you look back. Yeah. Then yeah. you can say, oh, that was that, that was that, that was that. Or like um, one of my sessions, I, I uncovered the guilt, finally. And I just started feeling guilt. And then Ron's like, see, see, I told you. So you can't go, you can't go looking for it, is what I'm trying to say. It, it just so you're not shows up. Shows the situation by going through each of them. Yeah. yeah, it's not yeah. like that. Yeah, you don't have to do it. The navigator will take you through it when you're ready, at the most appropriate time. And right now, a lot of people are going through it, and they have no clue. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, real quick. Um, so something that's helped me to process some of this stuff on my own, which also relates to uh, trying to interpret the metaphors that would come through, like uh, through dreams, is doing like an associative mind mapping of something that bothers you and then branching mm. that out. Yeah. What does that yeah. make you think of? And what does that make you think of? And what does that yeah. make you think yes. of? Yes, yes. And then you get down to the root. Yes. So you could do the same thing. You do this with dream analysis, which you would do with the, uh, you know, the interpretive mm -hmm. things that come to you is, what does a bird mean to you? And then what does that mean to you? And what yeah. does that mean yeah. to you? And, yeah. Uh, they say in psychology, if you go three layers deep in that association, you get down to the root of what it is it's really it's really to interesting you're bringing this up because um, what I found is that my navigator took me through those layers without my mind yeah searching without yeah. my mind asking the question I started to see I was being shown the layers without having even inquired about it it was yeah. amazing it's exactly yeah. what you're saying and when yeah. you're doing that association you actually don't want to think about it you want to what's the first thing that comes right. to mind write it down right. it's kind of like in a hypnosis they're going to be like what do you see <clears throat> yeah, i just yep. see this yep exactly those are so important that when this first existed Without these layers and stuff, this was like a crystal ball, and a crystal ball, if you've noticed, reflects everything upside down. And then when the unconsciousness um, moved in, it fractured all the layers and levels. And so it only makes sense then as we use the gold of consciousness and compassionate understanding and appreciation to bring the dualities back together, we fill in all those fractures and that sphere becomes whole inside of us again. And then we're ready to transmit that to others, no matter what species. Okay, so break time. And um, then we're gonna go into the meditation.